Well, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Seems a little boomy, maybe. I don't know. Is my voice boomy? Well, I wonder if you'd open up in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be continuing our journey in 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. We're going to be making a little uh, adjustment in Paul's writing, and we're going to see a little change in what he's bringing to the Thessalonians uh, this morning. We'll tackle a subject that might be a little more challenging than what we've seen before, but something that I think uh, we can all agree is a, a problem that's plaguing our world today, just as it was back in Paul's time. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to be reading the first verse, first eight verses. So follow along with me. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, and that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Why don't we just take a moment again to pray. Father, as we delve into your word, we ask that that your Holy Spirit would give me the words that you would have me share, that our hearts would be open and receptive to what you have to say, that uh, your word would would pierce uh, as it promises, Father, and and be impactful in our lives, uh, for it's living and true, and and we know that it can make a difference, Father, in the the lives of of us here this morning as we walk uh, away from this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, uh, my parents didn't really talk to me about the birds and the bees. Uh, it, it wasn't something that we discussed very much. Uh, and so when I would think I was about a sophomore in high school, uh, I think the men of the church decided that they needed to have a class on us kids to teach us a little something. So they had a biology teacher come, you know, slides, actually overheads, you know, that kind of thing. And Taught us all this. Thing. Unfortunately, it was a little, you know, a little late as a sophomore in high school, even in my time. Uh, so, you know, we had questions, and yeah, maybe there are some things that we got wrong because, you know, we learned it in school from kids, uh, and there were some things, you know, that we probably got right. But overall, it, it was, you know, a little difficult because, uh, you know, in church we don't really talk about those things, and as we were growing up. Uh, you know, our, my parents didn't really discuss those things with me. But, interestingly enough, the Bible is chock full of this kind of stuff uh, about sexuality, sexual purity. I mean, if you read the Old Testament, you, uh, you realize that the stories that are told uh, are chock full of challenges that people face about sexual purity. And so Paul is going to talk to us about this, and even though it can be an uncomfortable subject, it's something that we really ought to talk about. So a quick review, if you will. If you remember, Paul has been really sharing his heart, his gratitude, you know, prayers with, with the Thessalonians. It's been a rather warm letter so far in the first three chapters, talking about his care for them, how he wanted to see them, sending Timothy to go. And, uh, and he affirms the believer's position, as you can see here. But then in chapter 4, he's going to make a switch. He's, he uses the word... Finally, verse, verse 1, chapter 4. And of course, you might think, you know, when I'm, I'm sure they were reading this, you know, in church and they said the word finally, the kids were probably like, whew, this thing is about to be over. Uh, you know, and you hear, the, you hear a sermon and they say, finally, it's my final point. You're like, woohoo. Um, you know, but interestingly enough, chapters 1 through 3 have 43 verses, chapters 4 and 5 have 46 verses. So they were in for a little awakening that there was a lot more to come. So Paul wasn't really on his last point. 
he was really talking about a change in what he was going to talk about. He was, he was making a change of gears as he moved it really into overdrive and up the anity, the stakes, if you will, about what he was talking to the Thessalonians about. He was moving from kind of the warmth to more uh, talking about application. So finally serves really as a punchline as he's talking about abounding. And so I want to talk about three different aspects, and we're going to spend just a few minutes on the first two and then really spend more time on the application of the exhortation that Paul is going to be giving. So we're going to talk a little bit about his authority, his appeal to them, and then spend the bulk of our time really diving into the application that we can make, not only of the sexual aspect, but we're going to talk about some words that I think are key and important in dealing with um, just his letter in general. So, you know, this is kind of a written out version of, of the, uh, the, the passage there. And, and when we look at who authorizes this, you know, Paul can, can make a lot of thoughts. He can say, you know, that, uh, that there's a lot of good sayings, nice things that he's saying, but really, he's going to highlight some key things about the authority that he is writing from. And he mentions the name of God nine times in this short passage, including references to the Trinity, the, the, whole, the, fa- the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he is really trying to let them know that even though he's an apostle and probably has a lot of good ideas, probably was a smart guy, this is not Paul's words. These are the words of God himself. And the authority comes from God, the Holy Spirit, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's important, you know, we, we kind of perhaps take that for granted because we have the Word of God and we affirm that. Uh, you know, there were new Christians, and Paul was writing them a letter. And so some of the Thessalonians were like, who is this guy to tell us these things? And Paul's saying, this is important stuff, not because I think it's good, not because it's, you know, some nice sayings, but this is the very Word of God, and that's the authority with which he was talking to them about. Uh, not only does he think about this, uh, this authority, but he also is making an appeal to them. And he does it multiple times. You know, he's, he's been rather warm in his talk with the Thessalonians about their gratitude and their faith, hope, and love that we talked about. But he's going to change a little bit and begin to, to put a little more pressure on the Thessalonians as he's doing the exhortation. We request, uh, we exhort you, we urge you that you would do these. So he's using some words of emphasis to make it clear that these are important. He talks about commandments, things that he had said before. Interesting, and he, at the end, says, you know, I'm going to solemnly warn you that these are important things. He, he even makes mention that, you know, that this is not something new. Uh, you know, he mentions over and over again in 1 Thessalonians that this is, these are things that I've talked to you about before while I was with you. As you recall, he wanted to go back, but sent Timothy that he, they would kind of find out about how their faith was doing. But Paul was clear that um, these are not new te- teachings, but the things that he had talked to them before. Not only the commandments that we gave you as you received from us, just as you were told before. So a lot of things that Paul is saying in, this, in this, these, first, these first eight verses of chapter 4, he's giving them the authority of God, he's letting them know that this is a little more, uh, more important to you than kind of what we were talking about before. And it's an exhortation as Paul gets into, the, into this section. In f- verses 1 and 2, he's going to really start begin to, un- to unfolding what he wants the, the Christians there to do as in thinking about their Christian progress. We, we'll call it uh, you know, the, the Christian walk. We, we call it many different things. And Paul highlights a number of different concepts that are important to the Thessalonians and to us as we think about our Christian progress, our walk with God. You know, he appealed to them, as I just said, that we, we ask, we request, he says, we beg. Um, some versions say we exhort or demand, we pray. Um, and later on, he uses the word, we ought to do this. It's, it's a necessity. So he's appealing to them the importance of what he's going to say. Uh, Next, he says, we're, you know, this, is, this information that I'm giving to you is guided by knowledge and the fact that uh, we have talked about this before. You know, uh, you've received from us in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 15, it says, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. You know, this, we have the knowledge of, of God written to us in his word. So as we absorb and, and listen and read this 
book that God has given us, that helps us to absorb the knowledge of who God is, his character, and what he wants for us to do. Of course, they didn't have the New Testament. Paul was in the middle of writing that. But, you know, in, for Paul, it was, hey, I, I've given you this before, this knowledge that you have. Don't lose that. Next, he talks about the Christian progress is marked by our conduct, right? The, the word says walk. Some people say, some versions will say live. It's that, it's that Christian progress, that action, right? Uh, we talk about actions speak louder than words. And so it is in our Christian walk, right? We can leave here. We can, uh, we can say nice Christian words. We can, you know, invoke the name of God. But really, when people look at us, they want to see what kind of actions we have in our lives, And that's what Paul is saying, that it's your walk, it's your life that has the action that uh, will show Christian progress. Uh, Secondly, it involves daily improvement. It's really the punchline, if you will, of our slides uh, as we do this study. Excel still more, abound more and more. The Christian life is not a static journey, right? Right? Uh, We even have in the background kind of the race as it goes up and over the hills. It's not a static journey. Our Christian walk should be be characterized by continuous improvement, excelling still more and more. Paul then says that this ought to be grounded on experience. Interestingly, even though in the midst of trying to help them understand that this is an important exhortation that's coming, he gives them a little bit of encouragement and said, hey, you're doing this just as you are doing uh, and so he wants them to understand that there's some good in their lives that he's seen through Timothy, and he wants them to keep doing that. He wants the, our, our lives as well to be grounded in the experience. As we gain in our experience of obeying the Word of God, it becomes habitual, and it characterizes our Christian walk. You know, Job, when he was uh, in, a, in a difficult place and he was being challenged by his quote, friends about what he should do. And one time Job responded and he said, wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. With God are wisdom and might, and he has counsel and understanding. You know, as we, as we grow in age, hopefully we're gaining the experience of our Christian walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that habitual obedience to his word, to his calling, to his commands, allows us to rest on that and say, and say, that's good. And so Paul was saying, you are doing some of these things, so keep, keep doing them. Next, the aim is to please God. You know, it really gets to our motives, right? Why are we, do, why are we doing these things, this, these, these, this thing about obedience? Is it because we're worried uh, that people will think less of us if we, if we stumble and fall? Or is it uh, maybe just because we were taught that way in Sunday school? Really, our motive should be to please God. And that's what Paul writes about that we please God. And then finally, twice in the first two verses, he goes back to the authority that is centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only was the commandments exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ, but at the end he says, for you know the commandments that we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul was rather clear in helping them to understand the importance of Christian progress. And then he jumps into a beginning a little, more, a little more specifically as he begins to lay out the specifics. And he says, uh, for this is the will of God. I would imagine if, if we were to have a little uh, Bible study on, here's how you need to know the will of God, it'd probably be a lot of people there. It's, it's a fairly important topic, right? Many people ask about how will I know the will of God. Uh, you know, we think about our big decisions. I remember when I was in, uh, in college, I got, to, I, I got to own this, not that one, but one very like that, a, a <laughs> nice white 74 Volkswagen Bug. And I was, uh, it had a couple dings in it. I, I, someone somehow stopped in front of me and made me hit them from the back. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've maybe experienced that before. But uh, I was at a stop sign, and I, and I uh, came up to this car, and it was a beautiful car, and, uh, and it looks a lot like mine, right? Just a little, little newer, maybe. And, you know, after much uh, careful thought, you know, preparation, intense prayer, and uh, sensing the Spirit's movement, I bought the car. Um, and really the only true part was the last part. I did buy the car. Um, 
You know, and so you wonder, you know, as I thought about this, I ended up paying for this for five years. Um, you know, I didn't put a lot of thought into this. I didn't. It, it was really an impulse buy. You know, what? what is that? How do we decide, you know, was that the will of God for Dan to buy this car? Uh, you know, it worked because, I, you know, my wonderful bride really liked the car. Uh, <laughs> she, she managed to marry me even with this face, but with that car, it was okay. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I mean, how do we know that's the will of God? It's, boy, that's a tough question, is it not? Uh, you know, there's so many different decisions we can get into. Do we, do we get the red shoes or the blue shoes? Is God, does God think that's important? You know, maybe even a little bit more expensive. Do I, do I get the Toyota or the Honda? Uh, maybe even even more expensive than that. Do I do I buy a house around, or or maybe I rent? I mean that that's hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. We could spend a few years, twenty years in a house. Um, maybe even the question of who I should marry. Do you think do you think God wants to know about that and the will of God when it comes to that? You know, you can actually go out and get a whole bunch of books on who I should marry. I was looking. I'm like. That's interesting. People would probably take pictures of that. You know, let me, let me find those books. But it's a difficult thought, right? Does, does God, is God interested in all those decisions that we make and, and how we should do that? Sometimes I think we get so wrapped up about what is God's will, we forget about you know, our own preparation to do God's will, our own preparation in our heart to be willing to go. You know, uh, I think of for myself. I often, you know, I'm, I'm kind of type A. I like to I like to figure things out, and so I think of kind of that my life like a blueprint. I want to set it up and get everything lined up, and be ready, right? And then when everything looks good, my plans, my time, uh, then I'm, I'll just ask God to to you know put the old uh, approved mark on it. You know, Lord, if you'll just bless my plan, put the rubber stamp on it. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that God is really interested in rubber stamping. Uh, I think he's more interested in that we would be more like an open book, right? That he could write on our open book what he wants. Are we prepared to do the will of God? You know, I had my own uh, story about a blueprint. I was, uh, we really enjoyed uh, three years in Hawaii. This is our backyard in Hawaii. It was a wonderful trip. And we were, I was sitting at a I was sitting at the table with my lovely bride uh, as we were ending our time there, and it was like, what are we going to, what assignment are we going to be next? And I happened to have a mug that had a picture of, uh, of Florida on it, and, and knowing Florida, the beaches looked like this, and I said, this must be a sign from God. You know, I turned it around, <laughs> we, we need to go to Florida. Uh, and so I, I created a blueprint. I had this general that I was working for create a a job for me out in Pensacola, Florida, and we were all set, had the job all lined up, and uh, one day he called me into the office and says, hey, Dan, you got a minute? And uh, of course, every time you hear that from your boss, you're like, hmm, wonder what that's about. Uh, and so he said, you're not going to go to Pensacola, you're going to go to Shreveport, Louisiana. And turns out the beaches aren't quite as nice in Shreveport, and the, <laughs> the water's not quite as blue. Um, but, you know, sometimes we wonder, I, you know, get so caught up in my own plan of God's will, and I'm not open. I mean, we were happy to go to Shreveport. It was great. God blessed our ministry there and blessed our family. But uh, so often it's easy for us to design a plan and look for God's blue to, to, to rubber stamp our blueprint. And so I think about more that you know, the path to finding God's will is really not a program or a plan, but it's, it's more, he's more interested in the process of us, you know, our process of our holiness. We're going to see the process of our sanctification. It's more important, our sanctification and the process of getting who we need to be than where we go, what decisions we make, uh, and those kinds of things. The emphasis really should be on developing an intimate relationship with God and not on following techniques. Really, who we are should take priority over what we do. You know, uh, David Livingston was asked, he was going to Africa, if you know the story, and it wasn't going to be 
a very safe place. And they were asking him, what do, you, what do you think about going to such a dangerous place? And he said, I am immortal until the will of God for me is accomplished. And, uh, you know, God, when we ask, is willing to give us direction. He's, he's a good father, is he not? He's not a taskmaster. He's not interested in giving us necessarily a bunch of hardships. He wants to give us good gifts. And he promises in James that if we ask, he'll give us wisdom. Not only give us, but give us generously, right? Without reproach. Let him ask in faith without doubting. You know, uh, James John C. said, God never burglarizes human will. He may long to come in and help, but he will never cross the picket line of our unwillingness. Interesting, sometimes our unwillingness, I think, gets in the way of what God wants to do in his life. And some of that unwillingness, Paul is going to give a specific thing that he wants the church to do. And I can honestly say that they were struggling with it, and I think our culture struggles with it today as well. Just a simple command. And so sometimes our unwillingness to do the things that he's already asked us to do can stand in the way, I think, of us doing the will that we might think he wants to do. You know, if you just look in God's word, these are, these are all, there's only a few of the things that we know that God has asked us to do for his will. You know, people say, what's God's will for my life? Well, there's a good list right there. These are all God's will that we act justly and not be conformed to the world, be transformed, be filled with the Spirit. We're going to find out later in Thessalonians that he wants us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances, his will for us. Um, you know, sometimes I, I kind of created this. Sometimes we can, we can get off on our own way, if you will, off to the left. There, I have, a, I have a white van, so I think I have been off, you know, on my own way sometimes. And yet... I think when we find that if we stay on God's path in his word of what he's asked us to do already, we'll we'll find amazing blessings and victory in his will. When we are transformed, when we're spirit-filled, when we're rejoicing and those things. As As we go along the road that God has already laid out for us in obedience to the things that he's asked us to, then I think... His will is more clear, and we're, we're not worried about all the different decisions that we have to make, realizing that God has already called us to a journey of sanctification that involves these kinds of things. To submit, you know, there's a lot of mischaracterizations, I think, about God's will that, you know, it's going to be contrary to, to human reason, and, and that's not really true. You know, that if I submit to God's will that, you know, my happiness won't be there, Or if I have problems, then I must not be in God's will. And conversely, if I'm in God's will, then I won't have problems, right? Uh, All those things are not really true. You know, God wants us to be in prayer. I was thinking about what prayer we might pray about God's will. And I I heard a a sermon actually this week, and a, a gentleman said, we need to learn how to pray the nevertheless prayer. The nevertheless prayer. And it was an example of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 26. He says, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The nevertheless prayer. Is that, is that, is that about our prayers? <laughs> nevertheless, I was encouraged when I came to Hillview. So many, so many of you say, you know, we're going to do this, Lord willing, or we're going to do that, Lord willing. And it hadn't been a part of my you know, my thought process as much. But I realized, man, what a biblical principle that is. We don't want to say it tritely, but we want to really understand that that God wants us to. He says it in James, you know, today or tomorrow in James 4, we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there. Um, But you don't know what tomorrow would bring. And in verse 15, he says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Praying about God's will. You know, it's really futile to pray about God's will if we're really not committed to obeying it, is it not? So that willingness has to happen. So, so Paul continues now, he says, your, God's will is about your sanctification. You know, it's really about practical sanctification. We, we do have positional sanctification, as we talked about in the Lord's Supper. We are declared righteous 
if you were trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. So positionally, we're sanctified. But practically, we're struggling, right? We're still labored and burdened by the sin that we can sometimes do in this body of the flesh. Um, and so it's, a, it's practical sanctification. In 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us chain, cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the spirit of, in the fear of God. Practical sanctification, really it means to be set apart, to consecrate or dedicate. And there's a number of great verses that, that show what that's about in 1 Corinthians again. For you are bought with a price. We're not our own. Therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Peter, he writes, uh, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, that you should, people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So sanctification, there's a journey that we should continue. The will of God, your sanctification. And then Paul begins to lay out the practical aspects of what he's really talking about. He's going to put some action into the sanctification. And he's going to use the word that three times. For your, this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to control his own body. And that no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter. So we begin, if you will, to put on some meat on the bones to this sanctification. And before we jump into this, I do want to take a little detour and talk about verse Four of chapter 4. It's kind of a, a debate on what this really means. So I'll just touch on it briefly. Uh, if you have the ESV, you'll see that it reads that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. If you have the Revised Standard Version, it says that each of you know how to take a wife for himself in holiness and honor. And you're like, wow, how can those two be so different? And, and there was, in the Greek, it, it's not as clear. It says that each of you should get or acquire or obtain his vessel in sanctification and honor. And that's why, for the example, the King James, the New American Standard, just translated vessel. But what does that mean? Uh, and so most uh, of the commentaries you'll read uh, will, all, will say that it, it's like the ESV and probably the, the Bible that you have in front of you that talk about controlling our own body. A few would say that it means a wife, uh, but it seems to be that the translation to control your body accurately communicates what Paul is trying to say here. Um, because really, Paul is trying to get the point across that each believer in sanctification on the journey to become like the Lord Jesus Christ must know how to bring our own body under control, to gain, gain continuous mastery over it. Because we know that the impurity uh, that sexual immorality brings uh, dishonors the body. So as we go forward and we think about why Paul is writing about uh, sexual immorality to the Thessalonians, as you know, there's a lot of Greeks that came to know Christ during Paul's ministry there, and unfortunately, the Greek culture was marred uh, by rampant sexual immorality. Uh, this is kind of the moral climate in Thessalonica at the time. Not a lot of good things going on there. Uh, even in their religious worship, they were encouraging adultery and sexual immorality, immorality, homosexuality, fornication. Really, it was almost condoned or encouraged. And uh, as we look around us today, I think we could probably put a little check mark by each one of these, realizing, yes, all these things we see in our culture today, some uh, you know, even to a point where it's very discouraging. Uh, and Paul is already, and he's going to bring good news. And we know that the good news of the gospel that brings us along the journey of sanctification is going to transform us, not transform us into the moral character of the Savior who loves us, right? The moral character. that God is going to change us in obedience as we grow in the gospel and sanctification to change from the moral character that they saw around them, that they were perhaps involved in, and now to change them in the moral character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul begins the application uh, 
with really a call for abstinence. You know, he's, Paul is not saying, look, take it easy, you know, curb your appetite or, you know, back off a little bit. Paul is very clear. He says, abstain. Knock it off. Don't do it. It's sometimes easy, I think, for us to look around us and, and compare, you know, compare ourselves. We're pretty good people compared to our next door neighbor or coworker or whatever. Uh, but God has called us to a higher standard, right? Called us uh, in the case of sexual immorality that we just need to stop. We need to abstain. You know, it's interesting that when you go into the schools and we, we talk about how to prevent pregnancies, there's lots of different options, but the one that really isn't on the table is abstinence. You know, that one's not on the table, right? They got, the kids are going to do what kids do. God says, no, you need to abstain. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do it. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee from sexual immorality. When you read 1 Corinthians, you realize they were struggling with some pretty significant problems too. Flee sexual immorality. In 2 Timothy 2.22, it says, flee also youthful lusts, as, as Paul is writing to Timothy. You know, we learned as we went through Matthew in the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, actually extended this. You know, we, we talk about the commandment that says you will not commit adultery. And Jesus actually made it a little more challenging, did he not? You have heard it said you will not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's a pretty challenging saying, is it not? Abstain. <laughs> not only the action, but also the thought in the eyes. Not the, and, and the consequences really of having to accomplish this are even greater, right? Pluck your eye out if you have a problem. Cut your arm off. Pretty significant, it's a pretty significant penalty that God is saying, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, if we are suffering from having these kinds of lust. Well, the sin of of immorality, you know, is, is really a, a three ways. It's obviously a sin against God. Uh, you know, as Paul talks about this, you know, when you go to, uh, I think a great example is, is Joseph when he was serving in Potiphar's wife. You recall Potter, or Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife, you know, was trying to proposition him. And, 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 and Joseph responds, how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? Uh, how can I do such a great evil and sin against God? And secondly, it's a sin against the neighbor in chapter 4, verse 6. It says, each of you know how to, or excuse me, that no man transgress and defraud his brother in this manner. You know, the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. These are the, the commandments that talk about our relationship with each other. And Paul says, don't defraud your brother by committing an immoral act and sin. And thirdly, it's a sin against our own body. 1 Corinthians 6.18, as I already quoted the first part of that, flee from sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against their own body. Not only is the consequences of, you know, that, that I've, you know, sold myself, if you will, but, you know, the problem of STDs and pregnancies, it's, it's, it's a serious thing, sin against our own body. So how do we how do we overcome this? How do we how do we avoid this kind of, of sin? You know, if you were at the men's breakfast a month ago or so or so ago, we had a, a quite a long uh, two hour session or three hour session where someone came in and talked about some of these challenges that men face. And if you haven't if you weren't there. Uh, I encourage you to email either me or I know uh, Dave Westwood has the videos and you can listen to them. Um, but, it, you know, no doubt in a room this side, there are many people that are, that are caught up in the sin of lust and immorality and pornography. And, and so, you know, how do we defeat this? And I, I just thought of some things that, that have helped me along the road and, and I've never been a perfect man in this way, but I think 
there's some, there's some things that can help us, you know, in our thought life. You know, are we able to take every thought captive um, to really think about that, uh, what dominates our mind? Are they, are they the things of God or the things that surround us in our culture regarding sexual immorality? You know, this includes not only our thought life, I think, but even our eyes, you know, uh, so much of what we see around us. Uh, you just go to the beach now. Boy, you can't hardly go to the beach, you know, without seeing things that are just really not wholesome. How do we, how do we cage our eyes? You know, when I, was, <laughs> when I was going through boot camp at the Air Force Academy, you know, we weren't allowed to look to the left or the right. If, you know, you had to look straight ahead. And, and anytime we weren't, it would be like, hey, mister, cage those eyes. You know, and that's meant look straight ahead, nothing else. And I think sometimes, you know, as we're faced with the things that we see around us that will draw us into those lustful thoughts, we need to cage our eyes, um, cage our thoughts, so they won't be captured by these kinds of things. Of course, you know, pornography begs the question of what kind of things do we put in our computer, or our TV, and our cell phone. You know, I, for me, I thought about, you know, who has access? To, are we, are we, do we have a plan to keep our kids and our family safe on our computers and our phones? Um, it's so easy, it's so easy to get caught up in that. You know, I, I'm careful myself. I keep my monitor from my computer facing the door and I keep the door open so anybody can walk in and see, you know, what I'm looking at. Uh, accountability, you know, on your phone. Does you know, leave your phone out. Let your wife have your access code, you know, so that, so that they can see what you're seeing. So there's full accountability or software blocking if you need that. Um, we, I, I was thinking, like, when we're sitting down watching a TV show or watching a movie, would it, would it be okay if Jesus was there with us? Would he, would he give us the thumbs up on this program? I can honestly say that I've been on a few of those movies and TV shows where mm, maybe I wouldn't be so proud of that. It's a good, it's a good, uh, what would Jesus do if he was right here with me watching this program? You know, even in our coworkers or our friend life, you know, we sometimes, oh yeah, some people recognize that. <laughs> you know, uh, it, someone was saying that I think 36% of, of, People admit to having an affair with a coworker. It can be a very dangerous place. When we're by ourselves, we have people of the opposite success that we might meet with, that we talk with. You know, do we meet alone? Are we are we careful with what we do? You know, research, research says that about sixty percent of them be, of, of affairs begin at work. Um, how do we keep our our actions pure? You know. It's something that I've been careful about. I don't, I don't meet with another, a woman, a woman of the opposite sex, a person with the opposite sex. <laughs> you know, I don't do that. I don't have lunch with someone like that. Uh, it's, just, it's just what I've decided, and we just have to be very careful, above reproach, if you will. Uh, think about our social media life. Boy, that's, that's a problem, is it not? Snapchat, Instagram. Uh, Facebook. When, when I first got uh, a Facebook account, actually my kids wanted to get a Facebook account. So we had two computers. My kid went off, and I think it was Lindsay at the time, and she got, was getting her Facebook account. Well, I went to the other computer and started getting, unbeknownst to her, my own Facebook account. And so she got hers up and running, and very soon after that, uh, she was only a couple doors down, I sent her a friend request. And she said, no! <laughs> she didn't want to be my friend on Facebook. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, it was important that I know what she was doing, who she was seeing, what friends she had. You know, when I started my Facebook account, I made sure that everyone who saw my Facebook knew that the most important person on my Facebook was this girl sitting right here. And so all the pictures I had her in it picture on it. And all the pictures above had the family pictures on it. So, you know, let that be a, maybe a small way to stop people from thinking about me as someone who's interested. Because I'm not. I'm not. 
And we shouldn't be either. Lastly, I'll just talk about our communication life, you know. Um, how do we communicate? Men, men, how do we communicate about our wives? At work, at work, you know, in, in the way that we talk about our wife, do we, you know, I need to get a kitchen pass. Is that honoring? My ball and chain. Probably not many of us use those, that term, the old lady, the, the wife. You know, the way we communicate about the most important person, our spouse, you know, can help to set up boundaries. You know, we show care and love for our spouse. And, hey, can you do that tonight? I don't know. Let me check my family commitments and check with my wife, Rosanna. Wow, that, that changes things, doesn't it? Then let me, let me check and see if the wife will give me a kitchen pass. Is that different? It seems like that's different. And it creates that boundary of, hey, this is, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. Well, it's a, it's a difficult topic, and Paul says we need to control ourselves in holiness and honor. He even issues a very solemn warning because this is so important. In verse 6, he says, the Lord is the avenger in all of these things, you know, and we're going to have to give an account. It's, it's a sad thing. The Lord is the avenger. But marriage is a wonderful thing, you know, and sex is a wonderful thing as well when practiced within the bounds of marriage. Paul even insights at the end, you know, you're not, you're not uh, rejecting man, but God, when you don't accept these teachings. Um, so how do, we, how do we remain sexually pure? Well, he gives a couple of examples, I think. One is to know God. Uh, man, if we, if, we, if we desire to know God, John 17 and this is life eternal, that they will know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Wow, if we seek to know God from his word, from others, um, that can change our hearts, change the lustful attitude, you know, thoughts that we have. And secondly, walk in the Spirit. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Not gratify. He said we will not gratify the desires of the flesh when we walk in the Spirit. Yes, we, we're not like the Gentiles who do not know God. We know God, and we can walk in the power of the Spirit with what He's given to us. And Paul is reminding us to excel in this area that's a difficult area, sexual purity. You know, He wants us to be better and better every day to excel still more. So I hope that this will encourage you this morning. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word and a difficult, a difficult topic that is so needy in our, in our churches, in our families. We ask that you would just find a, a small snippet that would help us today to, in a small step, take the, the progress of sanctification and holiness and purity in our own lives and the lives of our families. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.